Hey, everybody. We have an exciting new show. I'm joined by Kyle Mullins, and we're going to do a show called Collecting Ketchup. So what we're going to try to do is every month, we're going to hit the top three or four things that happened in the collecting world. This is mostly going to be kind of card-based, but we might do other kind of hobbies as well. But we want you to catch up on whatever happened last month, these big games, big announcements. Maybe you saw it in the news, a 20-second clip. But we're trying to condense this down into one show. So for today, we're going to hit three things. We're going to hit uh, Lorcana, which everybody can't shut up about. We're going to hit the new Magic Lord of the Rings set. And then we're also going to hit this new Star Wars game from Fantasy Flights that was just announced. So that's sort of the, the run of show and what we're hoping to do. Uh, we're trying to do this monthly. We'll see how this runs. This is our, our, our first time. So Kyle, do you have any thoughts here? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm excited to um, talk about all these things, especially like I'm going to touch upon the Star Wars Unlimited, which I know has been touched upon. But yeah, all, all these topics are kind of top of mind, but we're going to try and keep this succinct so you can kind of get a quick catch up on this and we can always deep dive on these later. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, let's start with Lorcana, right? This, is, this has been a game that was announced at this huge Disney Expo D23 last fall, and you had these six promos, well, really seven with a Mickey Mouse that were released, and there was 900 printed of them, and the value of them is like absolutely skyrocketed, just like an absolute insane. I remember looking the first week, and it was you know $1,700 for all six, and I was like, that's a crazy price, and now it's like quintupled or something, right? So I, I think that Lorcan is a really inter interesting example of this brand new IP that's coming out and people are really excited. Uh, Ravensburger is the company publishing it. You know, this Disney IP, they, they've released already like almost 80 preview cards. And I'm sitting here looking through the preview cards and I'm like, these look awesome. <laughs> and so the, the, let me tell yeah. you first, the, the set's supposed to drop September 1st in sort of every store and it's going to drop uh, August 18th in, in sort of hobby stores. So they're trying to cater to that hobby audience. But the big issue facing Lorcana right now is allocation is nobody knows how much of it it's going to be out there. So they're doing set one. It's going to be 204 cards. So relatively smallish, medium sized set, but no one really knows who's getting what. So if you sit there and call your local game store, you're going to have them tell you, we have no idea what's going on. And I think Ravensburger is not super well prepared for this because they're used to making puzzles and no one goes in and buys 10,000, you know, special edition puzzles of like a wolf or something. Right. But people well, do that with stuff like this. Yeah. And I, I would say at least from hobbies, like at least from game stores, like from my experience and from some things where they limit the amount you can purchase as an individual. So even if you said, I will buy everything you get, they may say we're only limiting one or two, you know, cases or boxes per customer to allow a better distribution. But like you said, I mean, maybe they only get four or five, six cases or so. We don't know if this is going to be something that'll take up an entire aisle in Walmart or if this is going to be like, oh, I, don't, I was only able to get my hands on one or two and some guy booked it the second I got it. You know, like there's going to be some shark out there. Who's is going this going to be like, it's like we get like a PlayStation 5, right? It's like you have to wait two years yeah. to get... This is going to get like ugly in terms of people trying to book their spot and getting this item if it goes to these small stores. You know, absolutely. It will be talked about. They, and, everyone's eyeing it. Everybody sees the prices on these D23 things. Like this isn't going away. And what's too bad is you're probably going to have some kids that are going to be like excited to be like, mom, dad, like I want to play this, but they're not going to, the parents are going to be caught completely off guard over like all these like adult collectors who are like, I'm going to make millions of this, you know, like, <laughs> and are going to go after it, you know? So that'll really be interesting, especially come August, hopefully when we hear more information about this. Yeah. Um, so I think, I mean, the, you want to hit three audiences, right? You want to hit the players. That's your, your base there. Then you have collectors and you're going to have some investors, right? You're going to have some people that are speculating on this that think that they can buy low, sell high, and they're going to be driving up this price. But I, I think the difference between, you know, a PlayStation 5 launch where people were, you know, okay waiting two years to get a PlayStation 5 versus this, this is a brand new game, right? Lorcana, if there's a sour taste in people's mouths where they can't even get a hold of any of the product and it's all being held by a very small community, that's going to stymie that that player base it's going to stymie local tournament scenes you know it, it's going to kind of kill that initial momentum that you're going to need if you're truly going to be a magic killer then you need to be out the gates and 
I think that they they kind of screwed up with D23 and, and allowing the secondary market to go absolutely bonkers with these these six promos, right? Like, I, I don't think that's good for anybody, right? I, I, I get that all engagement's good engagement, but I don't think it's good for, for parents to be thinking about, you know, getting their kids into this game. They look and they see a booster box is 4X over retail on eBay, and they're just like... Never mind. We're gonna go back to puzzles, right? Well, they're, they're, they're gonna go. They're gonna go back to like Pokemon because that's right. accessible. That's still coming out quarterly, and that's cheap. And the kids are crazy about it. They don't really know anything about it, but they know other their friends have it. So, like, oh, I want some, you know? Right. Like, and, and, not, and with with Pokemon individual sets and going like, oh, I'm gonna spec on this. Like, I showed a kid a graded Pokemon card. He's like, oh, that's neat. What is this plastic thing? You know, like. <laughs> they don't care. They don't know. You know, the parents are like, oh, I had these in the classroom. I threw some out because I didn't really care. You know, it's like. Right. Oh. So there's this real risk. I think at the uh, this launch doesn't go well and that, you know, you're sitting around Christmas and the boxes are on eBay for 2X retail, 3X retail. I, I don't think you're doing this well. And set two, I think, is supposed to launch in, in December, December 18th. So September 1 is the public launch in all stores, August 18th in, in specialty stores. Hopefully, Ravensburger is going to be printing this stuff massive. There's no reason not to, in my opinion. Like, I don't think creating scarcity initially is a good marketing strategy. I don't think it's going to set people up for success. I think it's just going to long term kind of upset people. So that's our that's our Lorcana update. I'm excited for this game. I think it looks really cool. I hope I can get my hands on it for retail value. I remember when he's got people that like, I don't think I'm going to pay $400 for a booster box when it should be, you know, five ninety nine a pack. So. Mm -hmm. We'll see what happens with that. I, I think we'll definitely continue talking about Lorcana, but let's let's move on to Star Wars. So there's some exciting news from Fancy Flights. What have, what have you heard, Kyle? Yeah. So first of all, I didn't know that much about Fantasy Flight games. Period. So I put down a quick rundown just so we can kind of get on the same page sure. in terms of Fantasy Flight games. So they're from they're from Roseville, Minnesota, right? Founded in '95, so they're not like a new company. They've been around for a while. And they produce board games, card games, miniature games, role-playing games, and other tabletop games. Um, they're really known for their high-quality components, like their immersive world games um, and their gameplay mechanics, which is good. Um, and the company has other franchises, like, um, you know, they've published games in the Star Wars space before, but Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings, and Marvel... Um, and they, I mean, have, they, had that, they had that dice uh, Star Wars game, Destiny. Yeah. Right? That's, it's like I right. think I wanted like a, a freaking like a plastic tub full of the dice. <laughs> that was like yeah. what I remember. Yeah, and they they have one. If you play board games enough, you may have seen the awards on certain games, like the Spiel des Jahres Award. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like they, they give it out to certain board games that you know are recognized. Um, they got an award for that for code names in 2016, which I'm sure you've seen that. I didn't realize those fancy flights. Code, code names rocks, man. Like that's a great party game right there. Just just throwing it out there. Right. So like not quite the same game, but like they they're not exactly idiots in making games. Period. They they do have a parent company called Asmodi, which is a leading global game publisher and distributor. They do have their own organized play program called Organized Play, which supports tournaments and events for games around the world. So they do have like an established like you know, tournament um, yeah, setup structure. So they've done this before. Um, they do have a strong online presence and a good website, active social media accounts on like Facebook and Twitter and stuff. So that's good. So this um, is all a really interesting juxtaposition to Ravensburger. So Lorcan is being yeah. done by Ravensburger, which is a puzzle company, right? Like, and frankly, I think they were not ready for the excitement caused by D23 cards. And, and that's why you saw just some kind of, slow uh slow footedness i think with the response to the excitement around this game yeah I, I think what we're seeing here is a company that has the infrastructure in place already and a proven track record yep. jumping into this right um and they've done things for for uh, games of all ages skill levels from like cat the those casual family fun party games to more complex strategy games. So they, they have a wide range of depth there. Um, and they do have a dedicated fan base that is continuing to grow and active online communities and forums, uh, you know, that are talking about that. So that's good. So there is social engagement for it. Um, and in terms is, of, oh, is there a however coming? I thought there was a however coming. <laughs> that's what I was like, you know, it's like, however. No, I, I, I think we're, we were talking about that like juxtaposition with Lorcana where it's like Ravensburg, what are they doing? Who are they knowing? Like, 
I, I'm getting the impression here that like fantasy flight, like from, from what I've been learning is better suited, better structured, better set up to succeed, you know, to jump into this. And here's what we know about this star Wars game specifically. Right. So it's, it's going to be this uh, for those who don't know, right. It's a new trading card game. That's going to have characters from all over the star Wars universe and the franchise. Right. So this game is supposed to be fast paced. It's supposed to be something that's easy to learn, but strategically deep um, with a regular uh, release schedule of three sets per year. Right. So every four months they're going to release a new set. That's the plan. Um, the, the organized play has been designed alongside the game from the beginning with like weekly store level community experiences and worldwide large scale events. So that's what they're already putting in place of what they want to do. They want to get this local community and have worldwide scale tournaments, right? This is before this is even launched. The game has been in development for the last three years and it's going to feature never before seen art with alternate cards and variant designs for dedicated TCG fans and collectors. Now, how did they keep it under wraps for three years? That's the big shock to me. Sorry. So, yeah, this is good. So what, what this tells me is they probably have been outside of putting in Star Wars characters and dealing with the art is they've probably been working on game mechanics for something of like X character, B character, whatever. They can fill in the blanks with who the Star Wars character is, the alien name, or the references after the fact, right? Mm. But when it comes to actual playing a game, like how do we make a good game? We can slap the Star Wars stuff on it afterwards. So they can be like, how do we get a good trading card game going? You know, using the Star Wars IP is just kind of icing on the cake. That's what's going to get everybody sure. drawn in. But to actually mechanically put the game together, it makes sense to get something that works really well. I mean, if you have a really good game mechanic that works and you call it la 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 baba, you know, it's like nobody's going to care. Even if the game's really great, you know, they're going to be like, what the hell is that? But um, that, that's what that's telling me. I don't, I don't know what you're getting out of that. But my guess is they want to make sure they land this right. I mean, if you're going to drop a Star Wars game that's supposed to be competing with the likes of tournaments for, you know, now Lorcana, Magic, Pokemon, like they better hit the ground, you know, on the right but right they better get this going so they want this to be accessible to all players right straightforward mechanics no gimmicks um the game won't launch until 2024 okay. so that is a little bit of time right although this like the article and limited information we got is in the beginning of may what is this 2023 we're still not going to see this for a little while um, but they are putting a lot of resources into this project now, one of the really cool things, and I think you might appreciate this, and this could be a topic for discussion, limitless deck building. So unlike other TCGs, there is no limit to how many cards you can include in your deck. <laughs> it's always unlimited. As long as you can shuffle them, you can use them. So this gives players a lot of flexibility and creativity when building the decks. It allows for some really interesting, you know, uh, ideas and strategies and stuff like that. I thought that was fascinating what are your thoughts right off no, the bat? i, I, I like that because i think we're so stuck with this idea of 60 right 60 is just <laughs> the number 60 or 100 sometimes 40 but but it's never really unlimited right and, and so i think that's that's sort of a, a playful thing and this is also the evolution of, of ccgs right where, where games are sort of we we haven't really changed much as far as gaming, right? Like you had these waves of innovation where like, you know, the first CCGs in like the nineties were like basically board games. And then you've kind of evolved down to like, yeah. it turns out a CCG should be a 15 minute game, right? <laughs> That's like sort of the ideal format. I mean, limitless, di like, like this I mean, it is makes so it like finding your cards you want really hard though, right? It makes it like you got, you got your, whatever you're tracking, your Vader's you gotta, if you put them in a hundred card deck, it's gonna be way harder to find the Vaders, right? Right, so now you're thinking, okay, maybe I only want 40 cards in my deck and just like really a tight ship and get good stuff. Is, there's no bottom limit there? Like you could have 20 <coughs> or something in there? I don't know about a bottom. I haven't found anything about a bottom, but they are highlighting this idea that like you can make your deck like super, you know, thick and fat. But, you know, my guess is you're probably gonna come across these cards that are like really unique or, 
you know, have like a specific function, but they're going to be so deep in there that you really want to be more thoughtful in terms of what you actually want to dump in there versus like, oh, I need to find this one card. You know, unless there's cards that allow you to fish through your deck, that's going to be challenging. So maybe you don't want it much more than 60. I, I mean, I think from a, it depends if they have limits in the number of a copy of cards you can put in your deck, but. You know, this also is a great marketing strategy because now people are going to have these chase cards like, all right, I need to have 25 faders, right? And like the, you're going to see the secondary market reacting to decks requiring 25 faders or whatever whatever it is. Um, yeah, I, I'm curious. Like, I, So the art of this game, though, it, it's going to be – it's not uh, movie stills, right? It, it's going to be – like what, what sort of – they're creating their own artwork for it. So I'm guessing it's going to be either drawing, painting, computer rendering. Some. I'm just hoping it looks like the game Shadows of the Empire. Like that's I want it basically look like the Wampa from Shadows of the Empire. That's like what I would really love <laughs> for the art to look like on this. I wish there was more on Shadows of the Empire in general. Right, like really Dash cool. Rendar fighting a Wampa. Like that's that's the the highlight of like my teenage life, basically. Now, I mean, now here's here's another mechanic of this game because I want to continue the rest of this. There's custom dice, so it does use custom dice the players roll during the game to determine the outcome, right? So of certain actions. So this ad does add a little bit of chance, excitement, yada yada, but it does make it a little bit unpredictable. Personally, I'm not crazy about throwing adding the element of dice into a card game. I, Fantasy Flight just can't uh, get away from dice, man. They just love I their... Just, I don't know. They have like a long-term contract with a dice maker in China or something <laughs> like. They can't get out of the contract, but I don't know why they just love to, their dice. Yeah, to me, it takes, uh, it takes a little bit element of the strategy away, and maybe this is their attempt of making it a little more accessible in that you can't strategize it to the point of like a grandmaster and just like mm. own people purely on your deck because you're going to have to win on the dice two like there's they're probably mm -hmm. making it so you have a fighting chance even if you're getting slaughtered everywhere else with the dice you know i i don't know i'm not crazy about that idea but i just you know we'll see we'll see if it's something that's like used for side things and it's not part of the main play like every turn we have to roll a dice of how many spaces i can move or how many worlds i can move or something yeah. then that would be more annoying but if it's like okay i make all the strategy and now we're going to go to battle and my bonus will be whatever dice roll I get or something in terms of an attack, maybe. That's that I can live with, I think. So it's it'll like be risk, right? Yeah. Like risk uses dice, right? Like this guy's kind of okay, right? You don't mind that. Like, <laughs> risk is risk. pretty wild, too. <laughs> Dude, risk, risk is a great like teenage board game to like have your buddies over and like sit there and try conquering uh, Kamchatka like, or whatever, like no old Asia. Uh, well it'd be like five of us and then we'd all gang up on like the best player and then once he was out of the game we're like we're done we all win <laughs> yeah, right 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 it, it was always the player that started in australia right with risk uh no i i think uh i'm excited to see where this evolves and we'll kind of keep keep an eye on this you know it's 2024 is a while out uh kyle do you have anything more you want to move to, to kind of magic talk here the, um, the, in the, room. My, the the only other thing I will say about this uh, from like a collecting standpoint is yes, there will be like varieties and variations of certain cards, but for like a non collector, they will make it available to be able to buy complete sets of cards. So you don't have to like fish through lots of stuff to complete one. If you wanted to buy a complete set, you can buy a complete set. So I, I, I thought that was kind of an interesting element, at least in terms of from a collector standpoint. So even if you want to collect, you know, the alternates, I guess you have to fish through boosters, but if you just want a complete set to have it or play the game, then you can just buy that as is. So yeah, I, I kind of like that. And I think that's what they've done with a few of their other games with the Lord of the Rings is like a bit of a fixed game. Um, I need to look into that a little bit more. Um, but Definitely something to keep an eye on. And I think that this is a good segue into sort of our final topic here, which is the the Lord of the Rings magic game. So I think the last two games exist because there's weakness in the empire of Magic the Gathering, right? I, I think that the 40 million players that play Magic have become increasingly agitated with how Wizards of the Coast has treated them over the last couple of years. And I think that is creating an opening for products like Lorcana and this, you know, new Star Wars game whenever it comes out. 
So let's talk a little bit about the new sort of signature thing coming out from Wizard of the Coast, which is the Lord of the Rings set, set to be released in June, uh, sort of mid-June. And this is sort of this continuing part of, of magic going into alternative universes and sort of expanding it. Um, this was announced two years ago. I think some, you know, Magic or Wizard of the Coast secured the rights to do something like this, but they didn't really do anything on it. And they started kind of putting out little little Easter eggs earlier this year. And then there's a little bit of controversy because you know some of the characters look a little different in the cards than people thought they should look based on Tolkien's work. We don't want to touch on that. I, I don't think that's relevant <laughs> discussion. <laughs> um, but uh, artistic, you know, yeah, artistic license, interpretation. Artistic. You know, it is what it is. I, I will just say that, like, I think the the cards themselves look very cool. They look very interesting. I think it's really fun to see the Lord of the Rings universe, you know, sort of reskinned with this magic template. I mean, I think magic is the most successful game of all time for a reason. It's because it's you know, framed in a way the cards look nice and, and Wizards has gotten pretty good at making this stuff. But I think the big notable thing here, maybe this is a good kind of point of discussion is they've announced that there's going to be a one of one, one ring. It's going to be in the dark tongue of Mordor. Right? So it's, it's going to, it's basically, I think it's one out of three million collector booster packs. Uh, so but I don't. They actually, also were going to make. Weren't they going to make like ones like out of five, ones out of ten? Like they were going to make. Yeah. So there's, there's variations, right? There, there's Soul Ring, which is a sort of artifact. I think they're going to print them. There's 1,900 total, and they're going to print them in different sets with the Elven Rings, the Dwarven Rings. So th there's a lot of things as a collector that I'm like, oh, what'd you say? What'd you say? I mean, the, the one ring. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to bother chasing it, but this other stuff seems to be pretty interesting. Um, this is definitely money grab by Wizards, but maybe it's a money grab we like. It was sort of funny to be tracking this. The, you know, I was like looking at the pre-orders on Amazon. I was like, oh, should I buy some of these or not? And then once they announced the one ring, you know, the one of one, the box prices just like doubled, right? Because all of a sudden there was this excitement and, you know, somewhere a, a Wizards of the Coast executive was just like, you know, like, oh, <laughs> just like, you know, so happy. Well, it's, it's gambling at that point, you know, like, right. it kind of reminds me of some of the sports cars stuff. And you see this, like, you're all trying to chase this car that you know is going to be worth a fortune. Right. And, and I, I think that's, that's part of the issue, though, is like, when you have this one of one, you have to really worry about counterfeiting, you have to worry, you know, what if the one of one ends up in the hands of a Wizard of the Coast employee, right? Yeah, I'm sure the Wizard of the Coast employee is going to buy this stuff. It ends up with it, the friends or family of was you know like there's all these scenarios where like this could get kind of gross. I'm gonna I'm gonna randomly buy a booster. I'm gonna pull it like no one's gonna know for like forever. They're all gonna freak out about it. Right. <laughs> or, or just, like, no one ever rating. finds like, it. Nobody right? will know it. I'll just keep it and then be like one day be like, oh, I found this card. Like <laughs> <laughs> right, like yeah, you know, like an antiques roadshow kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that like that's the issue of doing truly a one of one. I guess it's one out of every three million collector boosters. So I don't. I assume they might be pretty more than three million booster packs, but I mean, know, the, who, who kind of knows? The super um, collector in me would be very tempted to be buying cases and cases of this stuff with the think like, oh, I'm probably going to pull it because I bought so much product, not knowing. Right. Uh, of course, I would pull it. Like this is the, the I am the main character of the story, so I'm going to pull it. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Obviously. Uh, I mean, I think more broadly, the set, the lands in the set look really great. I think they're going to be one of these kind of classic things to include in, you know, decks and, and collectors are going to you know, grab them. I think that there's a lot to like about this. Uh, I, I'm a little just, I think it's going to be sort of a one of one where this is going to be the only set. I could be wrong. There is, there's a lot of conflicting information about what their kind of plans are, but I, I do wish that, that, you know, right now magic is, just coming out at such a frantic pace and i think players are a little tired of it <laughs> and but, it might, but again like who who's the target market for this new product right is this product supposed to bring in new players or is it supposed to celebrate the existing players by bringing in something a lot of people like you know? I, I think it's the latter there because it's not going to be legal uh in in standard so it, like that standard is like the tournament format that goes on for like two years so I think it's it's going to be in sort of commander format and, and modern. And so but basically my point here is there's not going to be like a huge competitive play scene using these cards specifically. So I think the audience is definitely going to be uh, sort of existing magic people, maybe bringing some people back and forth. I mean, the number of people that I've just known from sort of the collecting communities that have been out of magic for a couple of years and are like, 
oh yeah, I'm gonna buy a case for of course. <laughs> like and it's like okay. so okay. Okay, so maybe it's meant to drudge up like some old magic people who feel like they've got the like the dormant away. folks, right? That and are just like, like I really I, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. I, I mean, even the fact we're talking about this right now, like, I, I haven't bought a Magic set in probably a, a year and a half. Yeah, I, I play on and off. I, I go through, like, two-year waves where I'll quit, and then I'll come back two years later. And I'm like, oh, this is interesting enough, and I have a couple things pre-ordered. I'm not going to say exactly what, because I don't want anyone to rob my house, but, like, I've pre-ordered some stuff. <laughs> uh, and, and I'm excited for it, right? And I think that's sort of maybe the audience is – the dormant folks that have sort of been watching the sidelines that, that play casually, you know, I always say the best magic format is the beer and pretzels magic format. It's just like have some buddies over, have some pretzels, have some beer, play casually. That's fun. Playing competitively, in my opinion, is pretty tedious, <laughs> but mm, um, I can see that. so I don't know. I'm, I'm like curious. June 23 is the you know public launch. Day. There's a bunch of pre-release stuff before that. But uh, if you haven't, like sort of pre-ordered anything right now i think set boosters are still pretty available it's really the collector's booster so that one of one one ring i gotta figure out a better way of saying that's like the one 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 <laughs> uh you know it, so it, you can just say the one ring like we'll pretty much know what that is the, the one ring is is only going to be in collector's booster so that's really the product that's seen this you know tremendous increase in value right because everyone's sort of speculating that i think the set boosters and the the draft boosters are going to kind of remain at a pretty affordable price point, there's also some commander decks there. So uh, I think it's a fun thing to dive into if you, if you want to get back and do magic, you know. Quick question on that. So the one of one ring or the top prizes that are in there, because I know there's other numbered category rings in there. Are those going to be available in any of the boosters that you pull through it or only through specific boxes? Like you have So, to so the way the way it's going to work is there's something called draft boosters, which are truly used to, to you know, you buy a box and you draft you know, create decks, which is actually the best way to play magic, in my opinion, right? You just get a box, it's a fun afternoon with a couple of buddies. And then there's something called set boosters, which have usually like one to three rares in there, and you can get some other kind of good stuff. And then the top tier are collector's boosters. And so usually it's like maybe five bucks for a draft booster, seven, eight bucks for a set booster. And then the collector's boosters can range from like 15 to 25 plus. So the collector's boosters, where you're getting all the good stuff. I mean, I've opened some magic collector booster boxes. It's just, it's truly like Christmas. It's like everything in there's a foil, right? You get these like there's showcase cards. There's, I mean, some of the coolest. They are fun to open. I, I got to admit, they're fun to open. And uh, you know, sometimes they can, you can get really good value on there. And since the magic market is such, you know, a robust secondary market, you know, a lot of this stuff you can pull like a hundred and fifty dollar card that you can pretty easily sell because there's you know high demand but like everything you know the magic market it's it goes like this it's like you know product launches and then like within three months it's like caving down right <laughs> so it's you know you got to get if you're really in, in the speculating game because you're you into know. the next thing right like right you, you know because the next set comes out i think this will have a little more longevity uh because of just the the token ip is interesting to more people but i, I definitely think uh you know, since it's not able to be used in, in sort of standard, I think that's right. Uh, I, I think there's not going to be as many players using it, but there's definitely been like casual collectors. Um, so really curious yeah. about this. Uh, I'll, I'll be doing some live openings of, on my own channel, and we'll check back in probably next month for our June update on, on kind of what's going on there as well. Um, but that's, that's kind of all I got on Magic. Any, any thoughts there, Kyle? <clears throat> No, I'm curious to see where that continues. If it, if they end up jumping outside of Lord of the Rings IP to something generic again, like afterward, then maybe there is something to be said with collecting a Lord of the Rings thing. Because you'd be like, oh, I just like collecting the Lord of the Rings stuff because that's cool. And maybe people stick around with that. So maybe it won't take the same dive as like a traditional magic round where you're like a bunch of no-name characters come, come and go. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, that definitely could be the case here. I think that it has a little more longevity and um yeah it'd be curious to see like a year from now what this stuff's worth is it up or down and how much is printed I, i'm gonna guess quite a bit's gonna be printed of the draft boosters and set boosters Th this is why magic has this sort of tiered system where lorcana they're just releasing essentially the set boosters there's one type of booster you can buy but with this tiered booster system you can have a ton of the first two printed and the final one you, you hold back a little bit and you, you know you set a much higher price point on it so you, you have a lot more flexibility in your pricing structure and how much you want to print based on, you know, having these three tiers, essentially. So 
Yeah. Anyways, well, Kyle, this has been fun. Uh, if people like this, we're going to do this again next month. If people hate it, we'll probably still do it again next month. <laughs> and so like, subscribe, check out my channel, Kyle's channel. We got more content on, on card games and all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, any, any kind of final thoughts here? Yeah, I just wanted to add Star Wars Tops Andor is out. Ooh, um, good reminder. And the Masterwork set is not going to be coming out until June. That's even though it's a little delayed because that's 2022 Masterwork. So that's a more popular Tops Star Wars collecting set. Um, the Obi-Wan Kenobi Top set will drop May 31st. And that's going to have, you know, some highlighted autos like Hayden Christian, Ewan McGregor. It's going to have your parallels, like one of ones, 99s, 75s, 50s, 25s, 10s, all that. Um, they're not going to be like art cards like Galaxy. Those will be, you know, more, um, you know, like the picture cards of kind of like Book of Boba Fett and stuff like that. They will have medallion cards and patch cards as well. They will have numbered parallels of those. So interesting to see where that goes. I think there'll be some, you know, top dollar autos and highlights in there. I don't see anything else crazy about that set in particular. If you really liked the show or like these characters, that's great. But yeah, so that, that'll that be dropping soon. We'll see how, how the print run is on that. If it's going to be like Book of Boba Fett, where they just went absolutely nuts and there's just literally boxes galore for days and nobody cares about it. Or if they printed less of it and then maybe it'll be a, a more of a collectible item. I'm hoping it's it's... It's the latter. Um, so we will find out soon. So collectors yeah. are going to collect. Uh, <clears throat> thanks so much, everybody, for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you next month. Deuces.